This week I'm going to preach on process and procedure part three, and I'm beginning to deal with the procedure. Next week I will preach on one more uh, part uh, of the procedure, and then three weeks, two weeks from now, I'm going to preach on uh, faith and uh, how faith is found in the tabernacle. And then the fourth week, I'm going to preach on what Jesus told us about the pattern of prayer that is from the tabernacle, but located in the New Testament. Did you hear what I said? I said in three or four weeks, I think it's four weeks, I'm going to preach on Jesus' teaching in the New Testament concerning the pattern of prayer that came out of the tabernacle. There is nothing in the tabernacle that is not represented in the New Testament. Period. Nothing in the tabernacle that is not represented in the New Testament. Then five weeks from now, before I uh, go into the Holy of Holies, I'm going to show you in that morning message how to take what I've been preaching for the past few months and put it into a 45 minute message. How to pray using the tabernacle pattern in a 45 minute message. And so uh, there'll be no stone left unturned. I want to start today by saying this to you. <laughs> I was reading this week that in the country of England they did a study. They found out that 23% of all Christians in the country of England ever pray. 23% of all Christians ever, ever pray. Now, 67% of people that call themselves Christians never pray. And then they did it, the, the further study on it was that when they pray, the 23% that do pray, they spend their time need-focused, praying about themselves, need-focused. So, the reality is, and this will also show up in my book, by the way, that the church needs to inspect itself as the real reason for the downfall of the culture. And when you inspect, when the church inspects itself, we're going to find out that prayerlessness has brought powerlessness, and powerlessness has brought weakness, and weakness has brought bondage. Amen. So consequently, when, where there is no prayer that has, uh, without the, the, the content being need-focused, God, I need. God, give me this. God, I, you know I've got this problem. I, I, I need focus. Where there is prayer that is only need focus, powerlessness will follow, weakness will incur, and bondage will ensue. So, when I'm teaching on the tabernacle for prayer purposes, I want you to understand the necessity. Why? Pastor, because you said so? No, 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 no. Because God set forth for the chosen people of God to have a plan, a pattern, a process, a procedure to approach Him. And Jesus turned around in the Gospels and used the very same pattern. I'll show it to you. Now my challenge to you over the next three or four weeks is I want you to go into the Gospels and I want you to start with Matthew and I want you to finish in John and I want you to find it. It's there. It's there. No one has ever put it together. But it's there. So I challenge you to read the Gospels in the next month. And then whenever I preach about it, I, you, you will... You will either have seen it or you will not, but when the day comes that I preach it to you, you will know it. Now I want to challenge you 
to begin to pray. Because without prayer and focused pattern prayer. Now someone said if I become a pattern prayer, I become a robot. No. You have to have a direction you're going in prayer. And you have to have a means by which you follow the path. Now let's look at this. Out in the middle of that street that runs in front of our building, what did you see out there? You're not out there right now, but you know it's there. What is it? Huh? There are what? Lines. What for? For you to do what? Stay in your lane and follow a there it is. Everything has a pattern. Everything has a way to go. Now that same pattern is going to be the same concept of road markings in Oklahoma or California. In Britain, they just will follow it in a different pattern from a different side of the road, but the concept is the same. So prayer does not necessarily using a pattern of prayer does by no means limit your opportunities to pray. In fact, it expands your horizons for prayer because it gives you the opportunity to touch on every mile post along the way. And that's what I'm trying to get you to see here. So let's look at process and procedure. We've already been through the process. We know that the lamp stand in the tabernacle was God's process from God to from 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 heaven to earth and from <coughs> earth to heaven, all in there, all given there. We know that when man, when David said that I will enter his courts with thanksgiving and his gates with praise, we know that worship occurred at the brazen altar. There they, they went through the worship of surrender, sacrifice, the worship of having a substitute, there they went through the fifth part where they forgave and were forgiven, they worshiped. And then they went to the labor, where at the labor they went through the process of praise. And then they got to the tabernacle, the holy place, and that was the place of blessing where they came in and found the process. Now let's look at the procedure. Exodus 25 and 30, stand with me if you will for the reading of God's word. And you shall set showbread on the table before me always. Now let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the Word of God. I praise you for these people and for their desire to hear the Word, to praise you and to lift up the name of Jesus. I pray that you will meet every need that's represented in this church today. I pray that You'll open our eyes that we can see in our ears, that we can hear in our heart, that we can understand what the Word of God is saying to us. And then, Father, then, Father, please, please, let us apply it to our lives so that it changes us. And for all of that, we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. We've taken a close look at the lax stand. Now we're going to look into the procedure and locate how God placed the furniture in the... <coughs> holy place to signify <coughs> how he would execute the plan of God for the redemption of mankind. Before we do that, let's take a quick look at how God does sees mankind in light of the Word of God. Now, God sees mankind purely through the Word of God. How do you know that, Pastor? Because I read Exodus 25 and 30. Now when you see this, you're going to see that God does not see you in your sickness. God hears about your sickness. God does not see you in your poverty. God hears about your poverty. God does not see you in your mental struggles. He hears about your mental struggles. God sees you through, look at verse 25, uh, Exodus 25 and 30. He looks out always over the table of showbread. He sees you through what the showbread represents. And that's a critical thing for you to know and understand. This speaks to why the table is before him always. 
as it represents, look at this, the table of showbread represents the blessings of God that are established through the cross, specifically for mankind. So the question is, Pastor, how does he see me? He does not see you as sick, poor, impoverished. He does not see you as being struck in your addictions, in your hurts, in the storms of your life. He sees you through the finished work of the cross. Now that's how he sees you. Hebrews 4 and 13 tells us that. It says, neither is there any creature that is not manifest. There is none of us in all of the things that we share with God that God does not know about. Every creature is manifest in His sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. The Scripture defines the process of God through the Word of God. It defines the power with which it works both ways to satisfy the need for the divine process of God from both heaven's perspective and man's perspective. <coughs> so when God sees you, He sees you through the finished work of the cross. As we've said before, there are seven works of the blood, translation and transfer that are applied to the life of those who are saved and to those who mature into the image of His dear Son. There are seven works. They translate you into Him or they transfer Him to you. That is earth's perspective to heaven and heaven's perspective to earth. Now watch this now. From earth's perspective to heaven, when we come to know Christ, we are translated out of darkness Colossians 1.13, into His glorious light. The light of the kingdom of His dear Son. That is earth's perspective <coughs> to heaven. Then once that translation occurs, there is a transfer that is heaven's perspective to man. That perspective is, what did the cross do for you? Period. Period. Once we are translated out of sin, out of darkness, into the kingdom of His dear Son, the cross then begins to transfer the image of His dear Son. How do we know that? Because Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 that we became through Him the righteousness of God. Today we'll only deal with those elements of the blood that are transferred for the purpose of developing us into the image of the Son. Now watch it now. You've heard me say this, so I'm going to go quickly. Sweat, our will became His will. The crown <coughs> transferred His mind to us. The blood from His back transferred physical and spiritual healing. The blood from His beard transferred to us the quickening of the Word of God that makes alive the things to which we speak. <coughs> the blood from His side transferred our ability to locate and work in His grand design for the church. The blood from His hands transferred the anointing to us for direct ministry to the lost and hurting who need healing. The blood from His feet transferred the anointing to the places we go in our earthly travels for the sake of ministry. So, there were seven transfers that the blood gave the believer that were equal to and were the same as what Jesus did. Because when Jesus came into the earth, the blood from His sweat began to work with the will of men and countless became saved. The blood from the crown transferred His mind into those that would start the first church. The blood that, that, that was appointed for healing healed multitudes. The blood that was from His beard that quickened the words that He spoke spoke literal food into the bellies of everyone that heard it. The blood that came from His side began to teach and preach and minister the Word of God through the church. All there, what Jesus did. Now let's look at the table of showbread and we're going to find some information that's crucial. 
The table itself is referred to as the table of faces. The bread was placed there as a memorial to God who watches, now watch what I'm just about to say, over his work. What work does he watch over? He watches over the grand design of the cross. The constant availability of the bread identifies the constant presence of God. He is constantly, every moment of every day, watching over what Jesus did at the cross. It is the consistent theme of Calvary. It is the consistent theme of the cross. It is the consistent theme as long as man remains in the earth and until the church is raptured, God will look through the eyes of grace based upon the cross into every man, woman, boy, and girl, saint or sinner, He looks at you through what the cross has done for you, whether you believe it or not. That's how God operates. That's called grace. Grace has three sides. We know that. It's the favor of God. It's the influence of God. But here we're talking about the way God does things. So when God looks down over the table of showbread, He is looking at mankind through the eyes of grace that the cross affords for them. The cross will always afford grace unto man until the day when the trumpet sounds and the church is extracted and all of a sudden grace and its dispensation will cease and the lamb will become a lion. And when the lamb becomes a lion, he will turn from the judgment of grace to the judgment of punishment and look upon those who did not hear the trumpet sound and call them from that day forward the generation of the lost who know not me. I know you not. The table itself, now watch this now. Did you notice that the last stand was made of gold, pure gold? Showed total perfection. But the table of showbread was made of acacia wood, covered in gold. And I began to pray about that thing. God, teach me what this means. And it took about two seconds for the Holy Ghost to say, they put the pure, perfect Son of God on a what? What was it made of? A tree. The showbread made against that wood, probably the longest lasting piece of wood that God has ever created, took that wood, formed it, and put upon it the perfect Son of God, the very gold that made up the lampstand became the pure and perfect gold that lay upon the wood that created the cross that God is standing looking at you through. What a great idea. What a great design. God took this wood, took the eternal Son of God, put Him on the wood, covered it in the gold that said there is purity on the everlasting cross. There is purity on the wood that I will look at as long as eternity and mankind dwells in the earth. I will look at man through this cross. You are looking at through the cross. It's long lasting. It has dishes and bowls and spoons that were covered in pure gold that sat upon the table. 
Here's the procedure that God has hidden in the tabernacle <coughs> that is significant for you and me. The wood represents the cross, the gold overlay represents Jesus. Then in Exodus 25 and 24, watch what it says. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold and make them too a crown of gold round about. They put the crown of thorns upon his head. And they looked at him and called him the king of the Jews, never realizing that in the tabernacle there was a table of showbread that had a crown around its head. And that crown called out for an eternal king, a king of kings and the Lord of lords, whose blood was being shed to change the mind of men for eternity. Oh, glory to God. Crown of gold round the back. How could we miss it? How could we miss it? Now we have the wood for the cross. We have the perfect man. We have the crown of gold to place around the perfect man's head. That crown from man's perspective was a crown for mocking. They call him the king of the Jews, but from heaven's perspective, it was the crown of his pure association with the Godhead and the sign that the divine plan that they produced for the redemption of man was being fulfilled. Exodus 25, 25, watch this. And thou shalt make unto it a border of a hand breath round about, and thou shalt make a golden crown in the border there round about. Now, I want you to get it. There was a, a wood that lasted for a long while. It had to be eternal because it was overlaid in gold. There was a crown around the top of it that talked about the divine association of the Godhead. And then there was a divine process in its border. Another crown was there because that crown would represent the high priest of our confession. The border in blue that the little woman reached out with the issue of blood, saw it coming and said, if I can but touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. And the high priest of her confession, the border of blue that this ship would a uh, table of showbread rained and rolled in gold showed the very crown and the border that would heal every man, woman, boy and girl as long as God looked over the cross. Man, oh man, oh man. He is the high priest of our confession. The stage represented, now watch this now. Do you know they put rings on the bottom of this? Because it was so holy no man could touch it. They would slide these staves, the rods, so that when they moved, no man would touch the holy material. And they would carry this thing with these rods. The staves represent the table would be carried by men but for the purpose of redemption, the cross would only be carried by one man. But doesn't it seem strange to you that Jesus turned around one day and said, you pick up your cross and follow me. Exodus 25, 26 and 27 said, And thou shalt make bread four rings of gold, and put the rings in the four corners that are on the four feet thereof over against the border shall the rings be for places of stage to bear the table. We can clearly see that the method for carrying the table were set on two sides using four rings. Isn't it strange that Jesus hung on a cross with the extremities being in four different directions? Isn't it strange that he carried that cross? Isn't it strange that that cross bore upon him? Now I want you to watch what I'm about to say. Man was not adequate to place his hands upon the holy piece of furniture. Not until Calvary. Jesus, on the other hand, was the pure and perfect transporter of that cross. Here is the important person of the picture. Now watch what I'm about to say. The cross itself bore no significance. Because many men 
had been hung on the cross. Simon the Cyrenian carried a portion of the way for Jesus. But it was not until the pure Lamb of God was placed upon that particular cross that the design of the tabernacle becomes clear. It was not until the pure gold of Jesus Christ was placed upon the acacia wood and that wood became eternal and the border of the crown around the top of his head would change the mind of men and the border around the bottom would represent the high priest of our profession whoever lives to make intercession for his people. When Jesus picked up that cross, everything changed. Man in the world had an opportunity to get back to God. What a glorious thing. Wasn't until the pure lamb did his job. The blood, the bread represents the man who referred to himself as the bread of life. Who would be the perfect sacrifice to be given for all mankind. Now there were garnishings on the table. There would be food that would come from this exercise that would be enough to fill the spirits of any man who came to this table for spiritual sustenance. The procedure had to be in this place because, watch this, without the sacrifice located in the holy place, there would be no annulment of the law that took place in the outer court. Therefore, there would be no redemption for man's sins. The law would continue to be the lesser covenant and man's rebellion would remain the prevalent behavior. But with the procedure in the place of the Holy of Holies, there would be a new covenant and a new birth that would allow man to know God in his acts and in his ways. You, my friends, have the benefit of the cross over your life that allows you to know God in his benefits, in his acts, and in his ways and to understand that because of the cross God is looking down from heaven through the vision that occurred when Jesus said it is finished God was saying to man I will no longer look at you in the way that we had to look at creation after Adam and after Eve fell. The curse is removed and the cross is the reason and the cross is the way and the cross is the method whereby you will be viewed by your heavenly Father. What a divine plan of God. The new covenant of the cross would write a new law in the hearts of men whereby we could actively encounter God individually. This is what's so beautiful. He showed you the process, then he told you the procedure. If you will but come through the cross. If you will but come in the method that God sees you. If you will but understand that the way God sees you is not the way you see yourself. See, we see ourselves as old. We see ourselves as broken down. We see ourselves in the middle of storms. God does not see you there. He sees you through the eight works of the cross. He sees you through the death the burial, the descension into hell that caused you to no longer, if you know him, to have to worry about that city. He sees you through the resurrection. He sees you through the eyes of his walk among men. He sees you through the eyes of his ascension. He sees you through the eyes of the Shekinah glory of God that received him into heaven. He sees you through the eyes of the high priest 
who oversees his own sacrifice in the ticket of the tabernacle in glory and there sprinkles the blood, his own blood, as the high priest in glory. And lastly, he sees you seated with him in heavenly places, totally acceptable unto God, the very righteousness, the standard of glory that the cross provides for his people. That's how he sees you. What a blessed thing, church. And it's right there in the tabernacle. He put it right there for every man to see. The only reason you don't see it, because you don't spend time with it. But when you spend time with it, and you realize that there were eight things that God did at Calvary, and every one of those is how he sees you. Huh? Well, he sees you as crucified with Christ. He sees you as buried with Him. He sees you as being free from death, hell, and the grave. He sees you as being resurrected with Christ. He sees you as walking among men. He sees you as being filled with the Spirit of God and full of the Shekinah glory of God. He sees you as a member of the priesthood of God in the holy place. And he sees you seated with Jesus Christ in the portals of glory. That's how he sees you. You can't get around it. Huh? Unless you ain't looking for it. If you ain't looking for it, the devil will push you around, toss you around, kick you around, knock you around. He'll make you uncomfortable. He'll put you in places where you know you ought not be, but you're there anyway. So you go along to get along. The devil will lead you by the nose until you realize what Jesus Christ has done for you. We ingest that work by believing on the power of the body and the blood that translates us from sin and transfers us into His marvelous light. Now church, the cross speaks for itself. What is done will never be undone. It will never be, watch this, done again. Never be done again. God doesn't need it to be done again. He only needs His people to believe, to accept, and to understand how He sees you. Now when He told you you were the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, when He told you that He bore your sin and made you the righteousness of God by force, <coughs> when He told you that, He included everything that Calvary was on your behalf. Because without Calvary, and the eight works of the cross. There is no resurrection. There is no seating. There is no high priest of our salvation. The victory established there over sin, death, hell, and the grave is accomplished for any man who believes. Now the question is, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> now I'm, I'm going to say this in closing. There are two kinds of people in this world. There are probably three. I, I, I'll say three. There, there is the unsaved. The unsaved places no emphasis in the cross. Because they place no emphasis in the life of Jesus. Then there are the saved. Who place no emphasis. In the works of the cross. They place no emphasis in the works of the cross. They simply believed on the name of the Son of God and are waiting for heaven to occur. That, that individual does not understand. How do we know what they don't understand, Pastor? Because we look at their lives. And we realize that they're tossed to and fro. We realize that their life is full of problems, issues, storms, trials. So they don't understand the cross. Then there's the third guy. 
the third man, Roman Boyger, who hears the preaching of the cross and realizes that in the cross and in its work and in its accomplishments is the way God sees me. Now that third guy can be in the middle of a struggle. He can live in the middle of storms. And don't, David said this one time, and it was one of the greatest comments that has ever been spoken in a church. So I'm going to give you a high five on it. You may not remember what you said, but I'm going to remind you. David said that people will tell people, come to Christ and everything is going to be great. Come to Christ, your life is going to so dramatically change. You'll never have a worry. You'll never have a problem again. Church, that isn't true. That isn't true. I had cancer. Others have been ill. That isn't true. But what is true is the Word of God declares that I will what? Keep Ain't that so? I will keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on me. What are, what, what are we stayed on? The cross. That's how a Christian lives in the middle of turmoil and looks like that they are absolutely in total calm and total peace. That's how a Christian overcomes the trials of life. Jesus said that you can be of good cheer. Not what? Because I live through the attacks, through the lies, through the degradation, through a face-to-face -face encounter with the devil, and you can be of good cheer because I overcame it, and as long as there is a tower, you can overcome it. Yes, sir. I will keep him in perfect peace. See, that's what I want. I don't want to be tossed around like I'm on a ship, a ship with no uh, moat and no stern, no, no steering mechanism. I don't want to be out in that life. I want to get to the cross. Because all I have to do is get to the cross. And from the neck up, from the neck up, I may be paddling at the bottom like crazy. But when you see those ducks and geese that swim upon the water, their little feces are going to town. But from the neck up, they're one of the most majestic animals to watch. Because they're working below. But on the upside, they're just at calm and peace. They walk around without a care in the world. They swim on that water without a care in the world. Why? Because that's their home. That's their natural habitat. See, we need to come to the conclusion that our natural habitat is the opportunity and ability to live in calm when all the world is going crazy. Amen. To live in peace when everybody around me is losing their head. Amen. To have a word of comfort when everybody around me is crying doom, 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 but the all to look around and say, as long as there's a cross, there is a God that overlooks it. And as long as He overlooks it, my life is secure, my life is stable, my life is full of prosperity, and I am living under the peace of the cross because Jesus died for me. Oh, yeah. Bad year. Preacher, I'm lost today. I've never made a profession of Christ. A couple of that sort. There, there is the person that makes the profession of Christ and struggles. And, and listen, until you come to the full grasp of the cross and how God looks at you, Life can be a struggle. We've all struggled. We've all struggled. Then there is the individual that may have never said, Lord, forgive me of my sins. May have never repented. May have never said, I need to be saved. 
I've heard the story of the cross. And the story of the cross has pierced my soul. And today I want to be saved. I'm going to tell you how to do that. That's as simple today as you saying, I hear the word. And I repent of my sin. It doesn't take a great show. It doesn't take anything more than right where you sit. Simply say, Lord, I repent. I want you to be my Savior. I hear the word about the cross. I want to be able to come to you and I believe in you and confess with my mouth and I will make you Lord over my life. And as you are Lord over my life, I'm going to be different. I'm going to go different places. I'm going to be different, act different, think different because I'm going to let you live in me. It's that simple. And then you simply say in Jesus' name. And the Father instantaneously looks at you through the cross and says, that's what I designed you for. That's what I designed you for. And salvation becomes yours. It's that simple. So pray that prayer right now. Then there is the individual that lives a Christian life, has been saved, born again. But that individual has never understood the appropriation of the cross of Calvary. That individual has never understood that when Jesus went to Calvary, he went to Calvary to cleanse you and purge you of every sin and make you the righteousness of God and make your life to be appropriated for your needs strictly through the cross. You are looked at through the cross. He ever looks over this cross, this table of showbread that represents the cross, so that he can see you strictly through what Jesus made you. So pray right now and say, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I receive what the cross has done for me. The cross belongs to me. The cross is mine. What Jesus did for me there belongs to me, and I take it today. I take it because Jesus died for me. He bore my sins to make me the righteousness of God in Himself. And I simply take it. I take it in all of its wealth. I take it in all of its prosperity. I take it in all of the changing of my will. I take it in all of the changing of my mind. I take it in all of the physical and spiritual healing that it consists of. I take it today so that I can locate my place in the body of Christ. I take it today so that my words will agree with you and quicken my life and others. I take it today so that my hands are anointed to lay hands on others that may be in me. I take it today so that my feet may be led by the Holy Spirit into the ministry to this world that is dying. I'm available to you today. And then there is the third person. That third person is the person that has heard the cross. That third person is the person that knows the cross. That third person is today that simply needs to be reminded that your life, that your issues of life are already under the blood. And you need to come to Him in worship, in sacrifice of yourself, in surrender of yourself, under the substitute of the blood and forgive yourself and others and then come to Him in praise and let the cross, <laughs> let the cross simply do what the Father has already appropriated it to do on your behalf. Three sets of people. Now in just a second, I'm going to tell you that three can be one. If you're unsaved today, you can know him. If you pray the prayer, you do. If you are saved but have never appropriated the cross, it belongs to you now. If you are saved and forgetful, be not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the word, it belongs to you now. So as I ask you to stand to your feet today, 
And in doing so, lift your hands towards heaven and receive the thing that you need because it belongs to you. It belongs to you. Stand to your feet and lift your hands before Him in whatever fashion you feel comfortable and worship Him because what God has done for you through the table of showbread is say that my presence is with you all the time. You can't get away from the cross. You can't get away from the cross. You can't get away from what God has established and from what God looks over on your behalf or how God sees you through it. You cannot get away from it. It belongs to you. It belongs to you. Now open your mouth and say, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Because I've got so much to thank Him for. I've got so much to praise Him for. When I think about all He's done for me, when I think about what He's done for me, all I can do is say, thank you, Jesus. Praise your mighty name, Jesus. Glory to your name, Jesus. I honor you. You are worthy. You're worthy of my praise. You're worthy of my raising my hand. You're worthy of my raising my voice. You're worthy of me calling on you. And you're worthy of all of the goodness and glory that I can give you. Praise your mighty name. Praise your mighty name. Joey, sing it, would you? I've got so much to do. Can you sing it right there where you are? And I've got so much to thank Him for, so much to praise Him for. Well, you see, He has been Glory so to good God. to me. Hallelujah. And when I think oh, of what He's Glory done, to God. Hallelujah. I, I, I worry about you, Frost. Oh yes. Sing it with me. And I've got so much to thank him for, so much to praise him for. Well, you see, he's been so good. Yes, he has. Hallelujah to the Lamb. When I think about all oh, what he's done and where he brought you from. Oh, yes. Yes, just so much. Just sing it one more time. Lift your hands and praise him. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Oh, you do. You do. You do. He saved you. He's given you the cross. He's been so good to me. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. When I think about what is done and where He brought us from, I got so much to thank Him for. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Glory to God. That is glorious. That is glorious. 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 Lorraine, you got anything to thank him for? Oh, Lord. I got so much. I praise him. I do. Yes. You can only imagine. You know, I praise him for what he's looked over me. And also, I praise him that I see things that's happened to people, and I thank God I'm. I've never had to face those problems. Yeah. You know, that's a blessing right there. Yes. We just, it's, it's amazing that we're standing here. That's a blessing. That's right. You get up every morning, got a job, and yeah. you get to see and, and a lot of things. Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. people think we ain't got blessings. If that's you right. ain't got nothing, you get up and you've been able to talk and walk. That's you right. go down the halls at the hospital and you hear people hollering yeah. at you and wondering what's wrong. And you yeah. go in there and you can't help them. Yeah. We're not allowed to touch them, but it's pitiful. Yeah, All yes. you can do is pray for them. I'm telling right. you, in your right mind, you better thank the good Lord for that. <laughs> that's a Isn't blessing. That right? Amen. 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 Amen.
Betty, do you have anything to praise God for? I don't even know where to start. Amen. See, church, this is real. It's real. Mary, do you have anything to praise God for? Yeah. So much time. Yeah. So many places that he has given it to me, and I was worthy. Mm -hmm. I love this church.